Acuity has grown to now well over 50,000 businesses to help them do everything from just pick a convenient time, handle canceling and rescheduling, but also fill out intake forms, you know, accept payments, send reminder emails, and have everything just beautifully customized to your brand. Get ready to build, protect, and sell your expertise online with the Online Genius Podcast. You'll laugh. We hope you won't cry. But you'll always be informed and prepared so you can have the success you want. Here's your host, Bobby Klink. Hey, everybody. Welcome to this week's episode of the Online Genius Podcast. I'm your host, Bobby Klink. I'm really excited about today's show because we're going to be talking about how you can use technology to better serve your clients and customers and how you can make things more efficient for yourself as a business person. Now, as I told you in episode 11, I am not great with setting up systems and processes in my business, but there are certainly some areas that are no-brainers. And one of the areas that's a no-brainer and that I have actually taken steps to automate is my appointment scheduling system. And today's guest expert knows a heck of a lot more about automated scheduling and automated systems than I do. Today, we're going to hear from Gavin Zuklinski. Gavin is the founder of Acuity Scheduling, the slickest way for businesses to automate and manage their appointments online, allowing clients to schedule themselves. Gavin is a self-professed tech geek and espresso maniac, a word he does not use lightly, who wholeheartedly believes that business should be fun. Now, his business, Acuity Scheduling, supports over 50,000 businesses of all sizes from people working for themselves to major corporations with thousands of employees. Their customer support is unmatched in the industry as they focus on easy and pain-free scheduling with one-on-one support as they help their clients' businesses grow and thrive. And I can personally attest to Acuity being a great program because they're the scheduling system that I use. Now, I didn't always use them, but I recently made the change to them and I have never been happier. So, welcome to the Online Genius Podcast, Gavin. Thank you for having me on here. That's an awesome introduction. Well, you know, it's good when I, it's easy when I have a wonderful guest like you. <laughs> I love it. Now, I'm excited to talk about automation and all things automation, but before I do that, I always like to ask my guests some personal things. And what jumped out at me in, in our kind of looking over your bio is this espresso maniac thing. Mm-hmm. Now, I have to ask you something, your views on something. Have you seen that Starbucks recently came out with blonde espresso? Oh, I haven't seen that blonde espresso. I've had their drip coffee in the light roast one. Yeah, I don't know about you, but to me, the word blonde espresso just doesn't make sense. That would be like saying a blonde stout. It just, (laughs) it's a contradiction in terms. Yeah, it, man, it is. I don't know. So I'm like, on the super, super geek side, I actually roast my own coffee. So I try it at different roast levels and everything else, like the same beans and everything else. And coffee that's too light when you're extracting it, when like the espresso with under like high pressure and everything else, if it's too light, like the light florally flavors and, and all that crap that you're supposed to get from a lighter roast, it just doesn't come out right. So you need a darker one and like those nuttier flavors and everything else. So yeah, it doesn't, I don't know. That's just yeah. a, a waste of some good beans, I bet. Yeah, I'm with you. That, that was my view. I just said, you know, espresso is actually, as I understand it, that is a, a term for a particular roast, a particular darkness of roast. So calling it blonde just doesn't make a lot of sense. But Oh, yeah. We can really geek out about this if you want. We can have no. a whole <laughs> episode on coffee. So, like, I don't know. So, it's it's actually not a particular roast. It's a technique more than anything. But it, like you're saying, it's pretty much synonymous with a particular roast because if you try lighter ones, it's it's terrible. It's a, it's terrible. But I don't know. Now I'm actually half intrigued because I want to try it. Maybe they did it. You know, like if you've got the right bean, you could do something really. Ooh, I don't know. Oh my my inner geekdom about coffee is coming out now. Well, I hope that I've actually given you something that will, you know, make your life better by letting you try that (laughs) rather than make your life worse. Yeah. But, you know, now let's move on to the meat and let's move to kind of why you're here. And now, normally I don't ask people kind of their, their story, but I think you have an interesting story about how you came up with the idea for acuity scheduling. As I understand it, you were just trying to solve a problem for your mom. Is that right? 
Yeah, exactly. So my mom is a massage therapist and we were riding in the car along Route 80 and having her pick up the phone and go back and forth with clients and having to listen to all the reasons why they were canceling their appointments and needing to reschedule and her pulling out her little paper appointment book, which really doesn't work when you're driving on the road so much. And seeing this go on, I felt like there had to be a better way. And all the time that she was wasting going back and forth with clients. And that's where Acuity was born out of. It was born to help her specifically her offer and manage, you know, reschedule and cancel and all that jazz that goes into that, her appointments, just that she could spend more time on what she really loved and less time on all the logistics that go into scheduling. So from there, Acuity has grown, you know, from her to now like over, well over 50,000 other businesses to help them do everything from just pick a convenient time, handle canceling and rescheduling, but also like you've seen and with your own use of it, fill out intake forms, you know, accept payments, send reminder emails and have everything just beautifully customized to your brand too. So it has grown a lot over the years and I don't know. It's nice to actually, she still emails in to support occasionally asking things too. Now, what I want to know is, does she have to pay for her service or is she grandfathered in and gets it for free? (laughs) Oh, I would be a terrible son if I made her pay. No, she gets it for free. And does she have a special line to support or, or does she get the same treatment as everybody else? Yeah, Great question. She actually gets the same exact support treatment as everybody else. She emails into support at acuityscheduling.com and does not get to the head of the line or anything else, but she still gets fast and friendly support. And it's actually really funny to see our new employees when they start out, if they get an email from her too, because they might not realize that she's, you know, my mom and the person that it was created for if they're not looking too closely. So yeah, it's always a great test too, because she can tell me, oh, they did such a wonderful job. It was so personal. Like they came back so quickly and all of that. And I love to hear that. She's like my secret shopper now. It's funny you said that. I was about to say she's your secret shopper. So it's fantastic. (laughs) Let me ask you, what were you doing? What was your day job at the time that you came up with Acuity for, to solve this problem for your mom? Yeah, so exactly. Acuity was not, you know, one of those things that I wanted to come up into a big business or anything else. I had a day job that I absolutely loved. I was working with the government, you know, around you in Washington, D.C. area, doing a job that was exceptionally unique and very, very different from Acuity. And I really loved it. And Acuity was the side project where I could take, you know, that more creative, like product development side and, you know, the building a business and and have that be something extra after hours that I did. And I also did a little bit of web development at the time too. And Acuity quickly outgrew that. But yeah, I was, it was a side project while I worked for the government. And I loved that until 2013 when the split ways and finally took Acuity full time. Well, so that's actually why I wanted to ask you this series of questions, because I think a lot of the listeners still have a day job and they at some point will have to make the decision to take the leap or not. And so how did you make that decision? What was the process you went through? What were the different things you considered that finally made you take the leap to go full time with Acuity? Yeah, so I was in the enviable position that I absolutely loved my day job and I did not want to give that up at all. So the only, re- like the reason that I had to make the choice was because I literally had to make the choice that I was spending so much time on Acuity and my day job was also, you know, occasionally night shifts and crazy hours and no phone or internet from work either. So I would come out to the car after working, you know, eight or 10 hours and, you know, find that Acuity had been down and I emails were piling up and I couldn't take care of it. That was, that was very early on. And it also came to the point too, where I would be, you know, after commuting into DC on the, you know, going around the beltway and everything else, I would come back after, you know, being away from the house for, you know, 10, 11 hours, and then have to do another six hours of support and improvements and everything else. So it got to the point where for my own sanity, I had to make a choice. I was lucky enough too, that Acuity was, was, profitable, not making a crazy amount. I think it was like $20,000 a month when I finally left. So it was in the comfortable position that I could leave. But I, it was really a choice of where I wanted my life to go. If I wanted to, you know, go with Acuity, which had a lot more flexibility, but a bit more unknown or working for something, you know, much, much bigger than myself with the government, but having a pretty predictable career path and cap on the potential upside of that too. So obviously, I made the decision for Acuity. And of course, I'm really glad that it did now, but I still wonder like what would have happened if I 
did it the other way and I don't know, somehow got rid of acuity. Well, we would all be much worse off. That's what. <laughs> that's where we would be. Yeah. Uh, now I'm happy. Like, I absolutely love it. Having control of my day is probably the biggest thing. Like, despite everything else, you know, despite the joy of creating a product and getting those happy messages from customers and everything else and, and having it having grown well beyond what I ever expected, just being able to control my day and, like, build a company that makes me happy to come to work every day, I think that alone is worth it. Well, so Gavin, let me ask you this though. When you made the jump and were able to really focus 100% of your effort on Acuity, did that kind of act as rocket fuel to help the business take off or did it not change your trajectory all that much? Uh, That's a tough one because I... (laughs) Having more time to work on something doesn't really mean that you're any more productive. All it meant is that the amount of work that I used to cram into a couple hours at night, I had all the time in the world for now. So I had to structure my day a lot more effectively. And I actually got to work on things a bit faster. So I didn't have, you know, as much time, you know, typically I'd ruminate on a feature for a couple of weeks or more before actually implementing it. So by the time I got to it, it was very efficient. And this sort of changed it too. But it was also to the point where just prior to me leaving, Acuity's growth had really ramped up. Two big things that I did that really ramped up the growth of Acuity is one, before I had spent so much time on like the product side of Acuity that the product was fantastic and the marketing site for it that people would see before they signed up was absolutely horrid. And I changed the marketing site, you know, to have more screenshots, be a lot friendlier, be a bit more modern and everything else. And that skyrocketed signups paired that with no longer requiring a credit card for people to sign up to. And that's what really, really ramped up signups just before I left to take Acuity full-time. So when I did eventually take Acuity full-time, there was a lot of feedback coming through. There was a lot of emails in for support and everything else. But there was also just a lot more time for me to work on things. And I don't know, because of that, I I think that the rate of growth wasn't because I left, but because of those changes just prior to me leaving. Yeah, those are definitely good changes. We all need to think about our marketing. So let me ask you this, because I know before I started using a scheduling system, I always thought, and I think a lot of people think this, I'm not really wasting or losing that much time by scheduling meetings. Mm -hmm. Are they wrong? I mean, what are the benefits of having an automated scheduling system? Yeah, you know, if you're booking one appointment a month, maybe one every two weeks, to be honest, it's probably not worth it. But for the people who are having to deal with the back and forth of, we did lots of math and other things, and it's pretty much like around three appointments per week where you find the sweet spot where after that and beyond, it makes a whole lot of sense. And then I also take the position too where our target market is really small businesses whose day-to-day revolves around appointments. So especially those folks who are doing many appointments today. Once you get into that and your business revolves around appointments, there's often so much more besides just, you know, fixing a time for it. That is the thing that sucks sucks up your your thoughts and your time and everything else. And so because of that, we can use that to automate a lot more of that. So just, you know, basic things like reporting and payments and, you know, forms and keeping track of client information and so that you know who you're talking to and what you're going to be talking about. But then hooking into all of the other tools that you use to run your business too, once you start adding up all of those little things, not just the going back and forth and, you know, having to respond to somebody when they want to cancel or reschedule, but also trying to gather that information from them, trying to chase after them for an invoice or anything else. And then maybe like we're doing this through Zoom right now, setting up a Zoom meeting link, all of this acuity can take care of for you automatically. So that time just ends up stacking and stacking up too. So you were saving a lot more than just the initial meeting link. But even if you were doing that, just having that three appointments per week is the sweet spot where just the meeting time alone ends up being worth it. Well, and and what I'll say, I recognize this in and I mentioned to you when we were talking before we started recording that I first came across these meeting kind of schedulers when I was appearing as a guest on podcasts a lot. And I know that there were some people who didn't have a scheduler and you know, yes, there was the wasted time for both of us and going back and forth on trying to set a time. But I know there were some podcast interviews that never got set up (laughs) because one person or the other just lets it drop. And I know me personally, that would be me. I would end up losing out on having appointments, having interviews, those things, Mm -hmm. if I didn't have a scheduler. So I just want to plug it 
for the listeners to understand. I think that's part of the benefit too. So just so you know my process, when someone wants to set up a podcast or when I found someone to interview on the podcast, I send them a link. They go to the link, they fill out a form that gives me all the information I need and then they schedule a time themselves. And so it's seamless for them, it's seamless for me. And oh yeah, by the way, then it automatically sets up this Zoom meeting and it automatically, I'm trying to think of the other thing. Oh, it automatically gives me a calendar invite with all the information. So I look in one place and find all the info I need. So Yeah, exactly. And we hear that from so many other businesses too. They're having the their, their scheduler be easier to access than, you know, their competitors around. There was somebody that was, I think, like a nail salon in Australia that was telling us that they started up their business and around the same time a few other places popped up doing the same exact thing around them. Fast forward a couple of years and they emailed into support they had been using Acuity through at that time and they were saying, hey, they were asking a few questions about growing their business and they said, hey, we're actually growing our business into another location. Location. Not necessarily because we're so much better than the other ones competitors around us, but they didn't offer appointment scheduling online. So they just got new customers thanks to the convenience part of it too. So it's totally true. Once you make it easier for your customers and reduce that friction to get them, you know, to commit to something, they're much more likely to do it. So scheduling is one of those ways where you just make it easier for them to do. They can, you know, almost impulse schedule something and they can really do it on their time too. So at one 1 a.m., you know, when you're not in your office, but somebody is searching around on their phone, laying in bed, they can book for you, you know, for the next day or the next couple of days and get confirmed and on there when if it was, you know, emailing you or needing to call you, they might forget or just never, never follow through with that too. So you're 100% right. Just that convenience can really help. Now, Gavin, I know that you almost certainly use other types of automation in your own business. And I think I mentioned at the beginning, that's something I'm not great at. So what are other places other than scheduling software where you think entrepreneurs should be thinking about, hey, this is an area I should try to automate. I should try to bring technology in because it's going to make my life better, but also hopefully make the customer experience better as well. Oh, yeah. And internally in Acuity, we are fanatical about this type of thing because it helps us scale up the business, you know, to 50,000 people and still keep our costs low, too. So we do get to see a lot of different ways that people use Acuity and connect it to different things in the different areas in their business that they use to manage that. Probably outside of just appointment scheduling, payments is the next biggest area that I see a lot of people doing just these very manual things. So, you know, we'll integrate with some of those. But even outside of that, just being able to handle some subscriptions and recurring payments and vaulting credit cards, which is actually something that Acuity can do now just because we saw that as a repeating pattern that people would need to use. The other two is just like this general idea about storing information. We do a ton of user interviews, and this is something that's coming up more and more is as a practitioner, let's say like you as a lawyer and everything else, you have to keep a lot of notes. And there's a lot of very specific software for this. In the medical area, you know, you got those EHR type of software to try to help with that. But we still keep seeing people creating like these paper notes that are scattered everywhere and or online documents that are scattered everywhere and just how decentralized that is. And also when you have that, it's difficult to kick things off. So I don't know, internally in Acuity, we use, we track like a lot of feature requests and everything else. And one of the things that I've been in love with too recently is Airtable, that tool. Have you heard of that? I have. I actually signed up for it and haven't used it yet. I saw an ad, I think, on Facebook. But tell me about Airtable because I want to I wanna actually start using it. I just haven't gotten around to it yet. Yeah, you know, I was the same exact way too where I saw it, somebody else was using it, and I was like, oh, that's cool. I don't know how I'm going to use that. So we just recently revamped how we're handling feature requests, which is sort of like a lot of businesses where you have all this data coming in. You have the information about your customers and everything else that you need to track over time. For us, that's hearing the requests and being able to track track that over time and sort of get an understanding of how that fits into context. And we looked at tons of specialized software and like everything that was specialized was just a little little bit too kludgy. And the most difficult part was when you get into two specialized areas, they don't connect with other tools to be able to, you know, automate those flows to, you know, either data in context to pull things in from 
wildly different tools that they don't support or, you know, kick off other processes. Like as soon as somebody, you know, we do a feature request that somebody wants, you know, start to email them or I don't know if you're in healthcare or something, you know, set a note to follow up with them in a few weeks or months or something else. And thankfully we were able to set up a lot of this through Airtable, having a couple of different, you know, tables within a workspace together, user data and feature data and tag it with different, you know, tags to keep track of it. So now we can, you know, quickly go back and see when people had requested things and and even more quickly like answer all of the people and like do a big blast out to them by connecting it to different tools too and just having that be sort of like with acuity where if you're business really revolves around appointments. That's the one of the central bits for you that you can use that to kick off all the processes to start automating things. That data seems to be another core bit and having a tool that can truly connect with different things and has the flexibility to model what you're looking for. I finally found that in Airtable too. So I'm, I'm pretty jazzed about that right now. Great. Now you've got another thing on my to-do list. I have to actually <laughs> watch the tutorials Good. on Airtable because... Yeah. You know, I saw it. I I think I saw it. It was talking about, I mean, you can use it to create your editorial calendar. You can use it for all kinds of different things. It's it's basically just a very versatile database tool, pretty much, right? Is that what Airtable is? Oh, yeah, yeah, exactly. It's a pretty versatile database tool. You can also have like forms that connect into it too. But one of the other things that I like too is that it's just on Zapier as well. So you can use that to kick off a lot of other actions too when you know you tag things or you add in different things into that area. So that, that part got me extra excited too because so much of the specialized software just doesn't connect to other things. And then you're like, you're on a little island all alone with your data when you could be doing so much more with it and really using that to automate your business. And I hate copying and pasting things around. It's one of those smells like if you're doing that, you know you're doing something wrong. Well, I, I think you and I obviously know Zapier and we don't even have to talk about it. But for listeners, if you don't know it, you need to learn about Zapier. It's basically a, a middleman, I guess is the best way to explain it, where you can connect a lot of different applications and move things around. I know I use it in my business to, for example, my sales for courses are one place and the courses are hosted somewhere else. So it automatically makes that connection, does those things. It's a simple example of what you could do. So folks definitely need to look into that. Now, Gavin, one thing I do want to ask you, though, or to help me out, I'm a very analytical guy, and that means I tend to do a lot of research before I take action, and I like to read a lot of books and things like that. So my question is, do you have any advice on resources, books, et cetera, that people could use if they're thinking about automation and automation tools that might be a good place for them to start? That's a great question. You know, to be honest, I I think there's really no books that I've found that have been really fantastic about automation. You know, by the time that hits it, it's a little bit too late. But I think a couple of those resources to start out with are Zapier, probably hands down number one. They have a fantastic blog too. And going through that covers a ton of just different ideas for things. And then Airtables also, because I don't know, for me, it's like, the act of wiring things together often isn't the hardest part. It's finding out the tool to begin with and getting the idea of like realizing that those things that you do every day that you just really just take for granted and you don't realize are sucking up your time are. And I love reading through just all of these different example, you know, snippets of tools and things that people have connected together and on the Zapier blog too, all of the different ideas that they have for setting things up in the same way too, that I just went and looked through Airtable when I got really jazzed about it, just seeing all of the examples of how they had things set up really sparked off me to set up things in completely different ways too. And the same for actually for Trello, if you're not familiar with it, for organizing information is fantastic because their blog goes through a lot of those same things of, you know, setting it up and trying to organize things and, you know, using that to drive and automate too. And of course, you can always follow Acuity after you sign up for an account and we send out newsletters too to see all the, the fancy new features that we have to help automate your business if your business revolves around appointments anyway. 
Well, so let me ask you this. You mentioned Trello. Mm -hmm. I hear about Trello a lot. Is is that an Asana competitor? Are they kind of in the same space? Oh, man, you don't use Trello? So, yeah, I've used Asana too. And I like Trello a lot better just because Asana always feels like a bit more heavyweight to me. I know that they have a nice new design and everything else, but Trello is just nice and lightweight, fast and easy to use and really easy to collaborate with people. But it's just the, I think... It's more of just one of the features inside of Asana, those uh, Kanban boards, you know, where you have different columns with cards in between there that you can drag and move things around. But it's just great and lightweight for project management. And I've looked at so many other things like Asana. And I, I don't know, for some reason, I just keep coming back to Trello despite everything. The only thing that it hasn't been good with is tracking larger amounts of data, which is why we moved over to Airtable for that, but previously had that all inside of Trello. No, oh, okay. And now I have to check out Trello. Another thing you put on my to-do oh list. My Thanks a lot. You know, you're going to have a really big to-do list. Oh, <laughs> what do you use to manage your to-do list? I actually use a paper planner. I use Michael Hyatt's full focus planner it's because like, that's the pa- only like paper you write on with like a pen. Yes. yes. Oh. It is a book, you know, it's a book, you know, so, you know, it's a quarterly planner that's about the size of John Lee Dumas's freedom journal or, or mm-hmm. those things It's about that size. And he has you focus on three tasks per day. There's a space to put more where you can put other things on your list, but basically says, you know, each night, the night before, you think about what are my big three for the next day. And that way you are focused on, in a sense, what's the most important for your business and not just trying to check off 1,800 different things, but instead what are the things you really need to do to move your business forward. So I love that. I'm, I guess I'm old. I don't know. I, I like paper still. I'm trying to get away from that, though. (laughs) No, no, that's fair. It forces you into a structure so you don't have to have, you know, extreme self-control not to, like, play the, like like you're saying, when you just get that good feeling from checking things off the to-do list. I use use Todoist, and that one I also go crazy with sometimes adding things to there. So it does take a lot more self-control to focus on the important things and not just the, you know, the easy things to check off. But it's actually another great one for automation. My wife and I use both use Todoist and we'll do things like for the baby or actually shopping list is an even better one where we can add things to our shopping list, have that connected to Alexa where we can just, you know, speak it out loud. And then when we go to the store, either of us who has it is synced up too. So we can be in separate sides of the store, you know, buying different things and checking it off at the same time. And I, I love that one too. (laughs) <laughs> you know, we could probably talk about this all day. The one, the one place where I think we need better tools, though, actually, mm-hmm. Kevin, so you should talk to some folks about this, <laughs> is with social media management. I have not yet found a tool that does everything I need it to do. So I end up having three and four different tools for social media management. So yeah. uh, I don't know if you have a suggestion on something you use that you think does it all. No, I mean, actually, what we've done more than anything is we've had diminishing returns on using social media for marketing. And it's actually not too great for support. And just because like, and Twitter, you can't really collect the information that you need. And often people are just directly messaging you in public channels, which isn't great too. And it doesn't tie into user accounts and all that. So it's not really good for marketing for us. Hasn't been good for support or anything else. So it's just something there so that people know that we're alive. And we've actually, you know, I don't know, just kind of been less excited about social media for our business recently because of that. So if anything, we're trying to tone down the note. We actually, we've got rid of a bunch of tools and I think now all we use is Buffer to try to manage that. Yeah, yeah. I, I use something similar, but not Buffer. But okay, so, you know, this has been a great conversation about tools and resources, but I, I do want to let you go before I keep you too long. But I do want to ask you one last question, which is, what is something that listeners could do either in five minutes a day or something they could get done by the end of the week that would really start to build their business and move them forward from your perspective? What's the piece of advice you would give them? Mm. So for me, it was after I left my day job and I was at Acuity full-time, I sort of just treaded water for a little while because I was kind of doing actually, like you mentioned, just checking things off of the to-do list without focusing on the big picture and sort of the one thing I did was sit down, think for a while about what are the real drivers inside of Acuity that as long as I get these drivers right, it'll move the business forward and then come up with a daily structure based off of that. So for me, that was, I ended up thinking the real things are 
acuity has to be growing in the feature set to be better than our competitors. It has to be easier to use than our competitors. And I actually had a lot of catching up to do with getting the word out there. So I ended up just setting a structure of three things a day, which was do one thing to try to market acuity, no matter how big or small, one thing that was either a UX improvement or a bug fix. And then one thing that was driving the product forward and hoping to innovate a little bit more with a feature request. And once I did that, it was just like setting the navigation right on the business and things really started moving forward to. That is fantastic advice. Listeners, I think what you need to take from that is that you can do small tasks every day as long as it's consistent. You just need to build it into your everyday practice. And the notion is that, hey, maybe you know you don't hit a home run each day, but you hit a single or get a walk. And then a year from now, you'll be amazed at where you are if you do that every single day. Yeah. And with Acuity, we are, you know, like almost 100,000 users and everything else. And it hasn't been any, you know, one giant thing. It's just been this slow, constant improvement. The product is always improving. It's always growing and it's growing at like just slowly, but at an ever increasing rate. And it's just, you know, heading in the right direction and chugging away at those things that are just really key to all the people. And when you make it better and you make it consistently better, more people come and more people are attracted to that. So it hasn't been anything fantastic. It's just exactly what you said, that just small steps in the right direction. Wow, Gavin, thank you for all for that piece of advice, but also for all the great advice you've given today. It has been my pleasure. Where can listeners get in touch with you, find out more about Acuity, about you and everything else? Yeah, so I will set up a link right after we get off of this call. So acuityscheduling.com slash genius. I'll put all of my information on there and I'll also put a special extended 45-day trial offer instead of our normal 14-day trial if you use that link. That's acuityscheduling.com slash genius. A-C-U-I-T-Y scheduling.com slash genius. Yeah, and listeners, don't, if you're driving, don't worry about writing that down. It'll be in the show notes, but you <laughs> definitely should take advantage of that. Acuity is a great system and 45 day free trial is a really good deal. You'll get a good sense of what you can do with it in that time period. So Gavin, thank you for coming today. It has been a pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. And that's it for now. Listeners, stay tuned for my quick legal lesson after the break. And now for today's legal lesson. Yay! Yeah. Wow. Gavin is great, and he gave some great advice there. Now, you may have noticed that my interview with Gavin was a bit different than a lot of the other interviews I do because I didn't focus on one thing only with him. We talked a lot, obviously, about using Acuity or a tool like that, but I wanted to bring him on because he has a really amazing story and could offer insight about a lot of different things. But for today's legal lesson, I actually do want to focus on how you can use automation tools to your benefit to get your legal stuff taken care of. And specifically, I want to talk about how whether you choose Acuity or any other scheduling software, but if you use a scheduling software or a survey software or things like that, you can set up to get some of the things checked off that you need to get checked off. And specifically what I'm talking about here is you can take care of getting publicity rights releases. Now, I've talked about this before, but let me give you a brief recap of it. The publicity rights doctrine says that every person has the right to control how their name, image, and likeness is used commercially. Now, some states give it even more protection, but those are the three big ones, name, image, and likeness. So what does that mean? Well, it means I can't use Gavin Zuklinski's name for my commercial purpose without his permission. And I can't use his image without his permission. And I can't use a likeness of him. So something like a cartoon that looks like him. I can't do that without his permission. And so the importance of that for you as an online entrepreneur is that any time you're going to have a guest, whether it's on a podcast, on your blog, anywhere that you might have a guest, you need to make sure to get their permission to use their name, image, and likeness. Similarly, if you're going to get testimonials from customers, you need to get their permission to use their name, image, and likeness of their testimonial before you use it. Now, in a lot of ways, some people think it's kind of implied. Well, somebody coming on your podcast means they've given you permission. And there might be an argument there, okay? But you want to get an express release signed because that will give you maximum flexibility. In the case of a podcast, let me explain how I can use that quickly. We talked about it with, with the Stephen Wessner episode a couple episodes back. 
you know, you're going to slice and dice that into a lot of different ways. And you need to have a release of publicity rights before you do that. So I've talked about that issue. I'm not going to spend a ton of time there. But what I want to talk about is how you can use an automation tool to actually go about that process. It's pretty simple. And this is it addresses one of the biggest concerns that a lot of people have and, and the pushback I get on getting releases. A lot of people think, look, I don't want to have to send a podcast guest this document that they have to sign. It, it may make them not want to appear. Now, I don't know if that's true or not. I think most people wouldn't care. You might end up not getting it because maybe they forget to sign it or something like that. But I don't think most people would object same thing on a testimonial. If somebody's willing to do a testimonial for you, they're going to be willing to to agree to use it. The difficulty is, yeah, the logistics of getting that done. So sending a document, whether it's a PDF or something like that, that someone then has to sign and send back to you can be a problem. So how do you address that? It's simple. You use automation tools. So as I mentioned, I think in talking with Gavin, but I'll, I'll tell you, when someone signs up to be on my podcast, at the bottom, there is a legal notice that says, you know, it's next to a checkbox and it says, you know, by coming on the podcast, they are agreeing to, you know, waive any claim to the right to publicity or privacy. They're agreeing to let me use it, et cetera, and all of those things. So it gives me that permission. It's the release I need. And it's very simple and straightforward. You can do the same thing, whether it's through some other software or if you're getting testimonials, depending on how you're going to get testimonials. Now, if you're going to get some kind of written testimonials along with, say, a recorded testimonial, again, you could do it through a scheduling software. You could do the same thing, get them to fill out this information in you know text blocks in the schedule where they're scheduling a call, for example, where you'll record an audio testimonial or video testimonial and then have them check the box. But if you're just going to go with written testimonies, you could do the same thing through something like SurveyMonkey. You could set up a SurveyMonkey survey, which is an automated system, send them a link, they go there, they answer the questions, and at the end, you just put a required checkbox that they have to agree to these terms. You do that, and then you are in good shape. So the lesson today is that you can use automation tools to get the releases, to get the permissions you need, and to make it straightforward and easy to do it. So it can overcome any fear you have or concern that people are going to reject the idea of these releases because it is difficult, because it's just not. You literally put a checkbox next to a text box that says what they're doing, and that's all you have to do. So I hope you'll take that and apply it in your business, whether it's for testimonials or getting permission for using any kind of guest appearances. If you'll do that, you'll be in much better shape going forward. So that's it for today's lesson. Again, I'll tell you, I use Acuity. So if you're interested in getting scheduling software, you really ought to give it a try. I don't get anything out of this deal. Gavin gave you that great deal that I would take advantage of if I were you and looking for a scheduling software. But that's it for today. We'll be back next week with another episode. So until then, this is Bobby Clinton signing off. Thanks for listening. And remember to visit mistakes.youronlinegenius.com to get your essential guide to the four legal mistakes that can doom your business and how to avoid them. Join us next week for another episode to expand your online genius and your success.